and the manager of collection and exhibition programs at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's desktop dialogue. Uh, while other guests are joining us, uh, use this time to familiarize yourself with the chat interface. Uh, to join the chat, just enter your name or really any name that you prefer uh, and click to agree to the terms of service and the privacy policy. You can use this chat uh, to make comments during the program at any time. Uh, and when you have a question, uh, pop it in the chat too. We're gonna reserve time at the end of the program to answer them, but you can you know, register those, those questions anytime really. And if you wanna let us know where you're coming from, that'd be great. It's always nice to see um, who's in the room and who's tuning in from where. Also below is uh, below the screen is a list of web resources that relates to this afternoon's program. Uh, we have links to Mario Moore's website, to um, the exhibition at CMA. Uh, and so feel free to take a look at those now or later. Uh, and lastly, this program is being recorded so you can watch it later on the CMA website or our YouTube channel. It should be uploaded sometime tomorrow. So if you uh, need to duck out early, you wanna share with a friend or watch again, uh, just uh, check out our website or our YouTube channel. So for today's program, Rethinking Artistic Traditions, uh, we're going to be discussing the value that contemporary artists and audiences see in historical art. Um, and really who better to give us insight into this topic uh, than a contemporary artist who sees value in historical art. Um, so in uh, his realist paintings, Detroit-based Mario Moore shows how traditional artistic practices can be powerful vehicles for exploring uh, timeless themes and the provocative issues of today. Um, I wanna you know, welcome Mario here, who's joining us from his vacation right now. So welcome, <laughs> welcome Mario, it's great to have you here. Um, I'm really, really glad to be here, thank you. Uh, and we're also really excited to have with us an expert on historical European art, uh, uh, Corey Korkow, who is CMA's own curator of European paintings and sculpture, uh, 1500 to 1800. Um, welcome, Corey. It's great to have you. Thanks, Andrew. I'm really excited to be here and talk about why the old stuff matters and to talk about its resonance for Mario's artwork. Great. Um, so actually, Corey, I want to start quickly with you because uh, we we um, we sort of developed this this sort of program to really be in, in direct dialogue with your recent CMA uh, exhibition, uh, which is uh, up now and I think through the end of the summer. Uh, Variations: The Reuse of Models and Paintings by Orazio and Artemisia Gentileschi. It's up through I think August twenty second, um, and it features a recently conserved painting of the mythological princess Danai by the Italian Baroque painter Orazio Gentileschi along with some other related works by him and his daughter, Artemisia, who is you know, incredibly well-known uh, 17th century painter. Um, and together, these really help us you know, give an understanding of studio practices uh, of, the, of the time. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more um, about, the, about the show? Here is Dan A by Orazio Gentileschi, and this is after a multi-year conservation project, which happened at CMA uh, with my wonderful colleague, Marcia Steele, the paintings conservator. Um, she removed a lot of discolored old varnish, some discolored retouching, and has a, sort of washed the bed linens in a way and given Dan A a bath, and she looks absolutely spectacular. So before this, she hung over a stairwell so that you couldn't quite see you know, some of the issues that were going on with the picture. Um, she was sort of far away and I guarantee you she will not be placed over the stairwell when she comes back into the gallery. But now you can go into the exhibition and we've created an opportunity for you to see some really behind the scenes um, images of how Danae was conserved, um, some of the issues that Marcia dealt with. There's a booklet, there's a great digital interactive that shows some of the themes. Alongside Dan A, we have some absolute masterpieces by Orazio and by Artemisia Gentileschi, his daughter. These are on loan from a private collection in Dallas, a work that has never been exhibited before. And then we're looking here at the violin player from the Detroit Institute of Art on the left by Orazio and on the right, Judith and um, her maidservant with the head of Holofernes from the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum. One of the themes that we wanted to explore is how Orazio and Artemisia reuse different models in their work. And this is a great example. So you can see how the violin player, her figure is very similar to Judith in the other picture. And so Orazio is 
kind of adopting models from his own work, but for very different emotional effects. And I love how you, know, you have the violin player and she kind of exchanges the prop of the violin for something much more macabre with the head of the defeated um, general, Holofernes. Uh, and so we explore that theme across a number of different works of art. But I just want to, as you said, Andrew, it's open through August 22nd and underscore the fact that this is free. You can stop in the museum and look at some of the greatest works of art by Orazio Gentileschi for free all summer long. And so we encourage you to bring your friends and family and um, invite you to do that. to the show and the sort of a taste of it. And, and as you said, it's really wonderful how you um, you and, and Marcia Steele, right through her co-curatorial co work and her own conservation treatments have really allow, or allowing audiences to sort of take a refreshed right look at this work and really see it in a new way and in new contexts. Um, Mario, I, mean, I wanna draw you into the conversation now. Um, you've actually uh, seen um, uh, a gent the, a, another Gentileschi painting of Denai, very similar to the one that's at CMA. Um, and I think it might be the first version, I mean, Corey, you can correct me on that, which is now in the collection of the Getty. And it was on view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York when you saw it. Um, and we had a wonderful conversation about the impression, right, that it left on you. Like, could you, could you tell us about, uh, about seeing it and some things that you took from that experience? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm really, really familiar with the Met. Yeah, lived in Brooklyn for six years. So whenever I would go to the Met, it was, you know, I knew where I was going. I knew what to expect. Um, and it's like it's like all other museums when you go into an institution and you they're like really, really old friends. You know, you know where they sit, uh, you know what to expect. So when I went up the the great staircase and went through the the first room, I go to my right. And there's this painting there that was not there before. And it like punches me in the stomach. It's, it was, I think it was, it was the, it was because I know that also the subject of uh, Danae and to see the composition and the color and everything was so brilliant. I, I just stood there. I stood there for at least five minutes before even thinking about moving or saying anything. Um, and I, and I think it was the way that the bed was kind of laid out, the the kind of depth and, and uh, perspective of the bed, kind of pushing it towards the viewer uh, in this really, really great way. Um, it was also the sheets. Uh, there's a certain kind of white that's there that really kind of is uh, luminescent. Um, of course, you can't really see that through the digital screen, but in person, it was just, I was just, I was blown away. Um, so yeah, seeing that, you know, I was like, oh, it's a Genileski. That makes sense. Okay, <laughs> I understand why this this looks the way it looks. Um, and I think there's something about Genileski and the way that uh, Razio handles fabric that is is just so fascinating. So seeing that um, in person, uh, I was like, yeah, I was starstruck. I, and you're picking I mean, up um, Mario on the you know the the. It's one of the things that he's most known for, the way that he paints textiles. And I think the the texture between the satin that's shining and the cotton sheet and you know the the gilding on the wood and also the you know the flesh tones. He's also known for that great subtlety in painting flesh tones. And I think that you know the way that her nude form is displayed across the canvas, I totally understand that feeling of being stopped in your tracks and thinking, what is going on here? It's such an unusual um you know um relationship between the nude form and the bed sheets and you know i think about the nude in general and how we oftentimes think about the nude as a kind of mainstay of greco-roman art or baroque painting or just historical art in general but you know in looking at your work i can see that the nude is really critical to your practice um and i'm wondering if you would talk a little bit about the role that it plays in your work. Um, and you know, I think you would help argue that it's timeless. And why is that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think when it comes to, to me, uh, and especially my mother being an artist um, and, me, and me growing up uh, around artists, one thing that I learned to do very, very early uh, um, was to draw the nude. And it was just this regular thing. Uh, she was uh, at CCS at the College of Creative Studies, and 
and uh, she was teaching there and she was attending school. So I would sit in on classes on new drawing class, like seven years old. And it was in that time, in that moment, it was never a sexual thing. It was all about learning the form and um, learning how to draw and, and dealing with anatomy, right? Because that's what's important. Um, if we go back to the uh, Janileski painting, um, what was what's really relevant to me in, in particular to this piece is the way in which uh, Janileski handles the nude figure. Because uh, to think about this story, there's there's uh, Titian, I think, has a really, really great uh, Danae painting. But in that painting, the, the way the light, there's almost like this splash of sunlight coming along with the coins that kind of represents Zeus. And it's it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot. And, and I think here, uh, Janileski simplifies that. And you're just dealing with the coins. You have the angel. But the way that the body is kind of uh, displayed, right, um, which is really interesting, really beautiful, uh, for me, the nude figure and the way that I deal with it, if you move to my painting, is to think about the simplest form and the most basic form of humanity without having the, uh, the kind of... Um, excess or other things like a t-shirt or clothes that kind of denote another uh, thing or another subject. Like what brings us down to the simplest form? What are we born with? We are born naked, right? And that that delineates um, us as, as human beings. And I think in particular for this painting um, and uh, female nudes, it was a way for me to talk about something that was missing, uh, particularly in, in Western art history, which is the black female nude. And and for this painting, it's always a comparison to what's considered to be beautiful, right? And to think about the Dene and to think about other kind of uh, Odalesque figures, um, they're all these kind of uh, ceramic kind of white uh, female figures that are portrayed as being the most beautiful thing. Um, so for me, the magazines kind of represent that notation of what's seen as beautiful, while also talking about the black female form as being something that is as important um, and as beautiful in itself. Um, and at the time when I made this, there was this comparison to the idea of beauty. And um, I think what black women with, uh, as far as America goes and how to consider themselves beautiful. I'm curious, Mario, because when I look at, I mean, the, one of the main differences to me between your picture and the Gentileschi is that the Gentileschi is a woman and a kind of idealized woman who's a blank canvas. And your, uh, you know, the woman in your picture has a lot of gravitas and character and individuality, which makes me wonder what the relationship was between you and the model. Because you know, when you're representing an actual person and articulating their character, it's not a one-way street. So could you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, at the time when I, when I made this painting, uh, the model was my girlfriend. Uh, she was, she decided that she was going to pose for the piece, but I actually saw a painting by Diego Rivera and it was of a black female figure. And I've never, I never saw a painting like that before. And the way that it was painted, and it was almost the exact same composition um, as far as the, the black woman sitting in the chair with her arms raised, there was nothing around her. And I wanted to have a conversation specifically dealing with the idea of beauty and how um, we as a society consume beauty into what's beautiful and what's idealized to us. And what I often try to do when it comes to uh, figuration is consider the individual consider somebody that really exists in this time and in this place. So when I talked um, to uh, Sharon at the time about the idea, she was totally down for it. So that's that's something that's really uh, important for me when dealing with the figure is because even though I'm making a notation about a broader idea about Black women, I'm also dealing with somebody who lives here and now that is very, very specific. Um, I don't want there to be an idealization because what I'm talking about is the the kind of commodification of that idealization. I want to talk about real people that represent a broad spectrum, of, a, a broader idea of, of what beauty can be.
Yeah, that's really, I mean, the, the, I like the way that you're sort of thinking about the sort of Gentileschi's idealized nude sort of, and, and your sort of response is, uh, is uh, or that that's part of a larger tradition, right? And your 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 response mm-hmm. is more is sort of grounding it in sort of a time and a place and as a real person. Um, Corey, I wanna I wanna ask you. I mean, there are also like you know Mario is, is obviously you you are right rethinking the nude, and there are other artists you've just mentioned as well, and uh, in in um, in the modern era, but also contemporary artists. But what about in the 17th century, Corey? Right, there are artists who are approaching these conventions like the nude in different ways. Right, um, like we can look at um, Artemisia, Orazio's daughter, and her her take on the figure of Danae. Like, how does it look different? I know this is something you have you have thought quite a bit about. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, one of the most provocative um, juxtapositions in the exhibition is to the ability to have Cleveland's Danae by Orazio alongside this incredible jewel of a picture from St. Louis. And this is Danae by Artemisia Gentileschi. It's painted in oil on copper. It's much smaller. It, mm. it has a much more intimate relationship with the viewer, which I think is important. Um, many of you will have heard of Artemisia Gentileschi. She was a very accomplished, important Baroque, so painting in the beginning of the 1600s, Italian painter, um, very prolific, traveled all over Europe, um, you know, had to be an, uh, uh, you know, a, a businesswoman, a, a, a much, almost a better artist than she would have had to be if she had been a man and extremely resilient. And one of the things that is important to know about her, but also sparks a lot of debate is the fact that she was um, sexually assaulted as a as a young woman. She was raped and then subject to a very high profile court case where her virtue, mm-hmm. her truthfulness was um, was maligned. And so she had to defend herself. And she's painting this picture almost exactly after she was raped. And for those of you who don't know, the story of Danae is one fundamentally about um, about assault, really. So Danae is the daughter of King Acrisius. There's a prophecy that if Danae has a son, it will the son will kill his grandfather. And so Danae's father locks her in a chamber that no one can penetrate except for Zeus, who enters um, as um, in the form of golden coins. So people look at this image and they project onto that Artemisia's experience, which is natural. Um, but I think it's worth asking. Does the fact that this was painted by a woman who experienced sexual assault, who was a an assault survivor, change the way you look at it as opposed to if if you thought it was painted by Orazio, as, as it has often been attributed to her father? Um, and so you can you can look at it from a psychological perspective. Say, does she look like she's in ecstasy or she's in pain? Well, that's kind of a very subjective thing to ask. And, um, you know, a lot of scholars even who spend their lives looking at at the picture don't have the same answer. Um, But also, you know, just the way that it's painted. And that's one of the things that's fascinating to explore in the exhibition. So you look at the idealized figure of Orazio's Dane, who has these kind of impossible cone-shaped breasts and very kind of plasticky, smooth but very beautifully painted, um, you know, flesh tones. And you compare that to this like actual real woman who looks like she has cellulite and she has wrinkles and she has a little kind of pudging belly and her breasts actually fall naturally on her body. And you think, well, you know, Artemisia and Orazio, they're both painting from the nude model, but Orazio is combining different parts and, and he's approaching it in a different way than Artemisia is. Um, so, you know, it brings up, a lot of questions in terms of interpret an image, the role of the artist's biography, how you read him. Um, And I know that, Mario, you have found Artemisia's work really inspirational for you personally. And um, maybe you could talk a little bit about why that is. Yeah, um, Artemisia for me is uh, definitely a a bigger influence than her father. uh, all, all the way, a hundred percent, and and I I believe th- that is because I I like certain painters that kind of I think they sit in a, a kind of place that deal with idealization, uh, but for me, Artemisia is talking about something that's real, right? The way that she paints flesh, um, you can see the kind of the 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 skin of it, right? The texture of the paint delineates um, that this I- exists. The way that gravity 
um, kind of sits on the on the entire form um, is very different than how her father kind of uh, paints, um, you know, almost these porcelain like figures, you know, um, there, there's something there that I can grasp, um, that I can understand that is beyond just the image. It's the, the level of impact. Also, my favorite painting is actually, uh, in the DIA is Genileski's, uh, painting, uh, of, uh, Judith, uh, beheading Holla Furnace. It's, you know, it's it's the one where her and her maid servant uh, is sitting there, and the the head is at the bottom of the canvas, and the way that head is painted, it's one of the 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 best painted heads I've ever seen in my life. It is it is incredible, and you know, it's almost it's almost in shadow, so you see like the texture, you can see some of the kind of the stained blood. It's it's just, I think there's something that Artemisia has. Um, and, and it's because the challenges that she has to go through that makes her work has have a really strong um, emotional feel to it. So with that kind of realism that she pulls into the world, and I also think even though her father was kind of looking at Caravaggio, um, she was definitely kind of considering that kind of realism that Caravaggio was bringing in um, art and pulling that into her own kind of space. And and a lot of times doing it a lot better than Caravaggio was doing. Um, and, that, and there's something there that, that I just really, really enjoy. Uh, and, and considering this painting um, into the, the, my painting that's, that's next um, is the way in which, again, dealing with the realism of the figure, right? Dealing with the kind of, how do you create the form to come out into this three-dimensional space? And how do you convince somebody that this figure is somebody that lives, breathes, and exists, right? And you're also challenging perceptions. And I think that's something that Artemisia was doing uh, very much in the time that she was working. She was ch challenging perceptions about the stories that she was telling. And that's something that I try to do in my work. Uh, kind of. Um ask you maybe an additional uh, an additional maybe question about this work like what um i guess what what to you is um um how yeah how how do you feel like this work might directly or maybe indirectly be responding to or, or inspired by that sort of tradition that we're talking about uh now specifically like an example of artemisia who's sort of bringing in that sort of that i think that realism and emotion like how are you how is that um, appearing in this painting of yours? Yeah, I think um, the way that Artemisia deals with, with the narrative, um, like I said, in, in composition is uh, different uh, to a lot of her contemporaries at the time. Um, and they even stand to the, to the test, you know, today when you, when you look at um, Artemisia's paintings and, and definitely her, her father's work too, right? Cause she's pulling a lot from her, from her dad. But for me in thinking about this work, is the way to kind of talk about different subjects that affect us, um, but also leave space for the viewer to come and say, okay, what's happening here? Because I think you get that a lot, even in very uh, biblical descriptive paintings by Artemisia, right? In that, in that painting that we just saw with, um, with the kind of uh, Dene, the same, same subject, there's room for your mind to wander in the painting. There's, there's room for your mind to question what's actually going on. And for me, for this piece in particular, um, I had an older sister. So as much as it is about uh, art history and painting, it's also about my lived experience. And, and, and you know, I, I think for Artemisia, she's, she's using some of those same, same kind of inspirations. And my older sister used to have those little paper dolls, you know, that you would cut out, you cut out the clothes, you put them on the dial, and then you can switch them up. Um, and for me, that was, that was me, um, kind of being enticed by that kind of story, but figuring out a way to talk about black men in America and the way that we are perceived when we wear certain clothes, do these items have the same meaning if they are not on my body? Um, if for me, a hoodie 
is is something that brings warmth, comfort. You know, if I'm going out for a jog or something, or if I'm playing sports and I want to work up a sweat, that's that's what a hoodie is known for. But once it's placed on my body or even in proximity to me, it it, it has a different representation that entices a kind of fear for America, right? If we think about Trayvon Martin, um, and 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 jeans and and these kind of labor work workmen's boots. So the the clothes in themselves. I wanted to almost represent individual figures. Like the clothes are have a persona on their own. But as soon as they're placed next to me, that persona changes. I, I like this sort of almost um th there's an interesting mythological um connection I'm I'm seeing now between this work, right? The sort of mythologies that we 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 speak of in this country in the United States and that are projected onto black men and a mythology that maybe you know, a different kind of mythology, but a mythology, you know, that deny and, and what that might mean. And also how, you know, Artemisia is, take, is sort of taking control of that. And 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 in this painting, you know, you might be um, as well. Um, I wanted to ask our, because um, I know we're, we want to get to audience questions. So I'm going to ask our audience, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat. We'll get to them in a couple of minutes, but I think we have one more little bit to talk about. And that's to do with um, processes and techniques, Mario. Um, you not only kind of working through conventions that might feel sort mm -hmm. of uh, traditional and sort of old and sort of European in origin. Maybe we can add mythology to that list now, right? As well as the nude, <laughs> um, uh, but also processes and, and techniques. So what is so important to you about um, about adopting uh, sort of these sort of more traditional and older sort of processes and techniques and having them at your disposal along with more contemporary ones, right? Uh, whether it's acrylic paint or digital tools, what 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 uh, what attracts you to them? What meaning is there in them to you? Yeah, I, I think for me, the the way that um, paintings were structured um, in the 17th century, and the way that they were set up, um, they all have a very uh, cinematic feel to them. You know, a, a, a very much embedded in a in a sense of storytelling. And I know when we talk cinema, we're we're much further ahead, right, <laughs> uh, in history. But cinema pulls a lot from uh, painting, and I think that structure, that visual structure, for me is so important because what I want my paintings to do is I want the person that's standing in front of the work to feel like they are engaged um, and almost are in front of someone, right? That they can almost step into the painting or the figures. Are, are coming out of the painting. I want there to be a level of communication between the, the painting and the viewer. And that is so important for me, um, which a lot of times in my, in my work, um, the figure is almost at the forefront of the composition. Um, and he, if you look at Artemisia, Artemisia's work, uh, the figure is literally almost right there, whatever the story is. Uh, and same thing for Orazio. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of right there sitting in front of you. So you can Almost if you were thinking about uh, the person playing the, the instrument, like you can almost hear that instrument. Um, you, can, you can feel the fabric. There's something about that uh, that I think is so engaging for me because it allows anyone, whether they understand art history or not, from whatever background they're coming from, to be able to engage in some way um, with what they're looking at. Now, you know, for those deeper kind of issues where, or those deeper understanding of, of the art historians or the artists or, or people that are interested um, in history, uh, they can engage more with the work and, and find like a deeper level of, uh, of, of mythology or, or weaving that I'm kind of introducing into the paintings. Um, and, you know, to, just to give you an example for this, for this piece right here, which is called During and After the Battle, this work is talking about uh, a very important moment in American history, uh, which is the Battle of Antietam. And the Battle of Antietam uh, took place in uh, September of 1862. And, and that battle was the decisive battle that um, allowed Lincoln to announce the Emancipation Proclamation uh, just, a, a, I think, a month or so afterwards. Before this battle, uh, the Union was losing terribly, um, and you had uh, other countries, uh, Europe in particular, that was getting ready to back the Confederacy to, to, to make them legitimate. 
And Lincoln was looking for a win, even though it wasn't that decisive because there was losses on both sides, tremendous losses. But he needed something um, because nobody wanted the Emancipation Proclamation to really happen. Right? He needed something, some little, little bit. Uh, and this was the win that, that allowed that to happen. And, it, and this win is so important also for the creation of um, black regiments during the Civil War, which really you know, caused the win of the Civil War. But it also allows the figure in this piece, uh, who's an artist friend of mine, to do whatever he wants to do today and now, right? He could sit uh, with his dog on his lap uh, in his art studio and, and just be himself, you know? So it's, it's those kind of things that allow a certain kind of depth um, where you can kind of look for things and find things that, that always interests me uh, when it comes to painting. Thank you. That's really, um, I'm, not, I'm just having, I'm sitting with that for a moment uh, <laughs> and thinking about it. I want to throw you into the question. Um, no, because it really resonates. I'm, I'm kind of understanding this, um, this sort of uh, kind of the time travel happening in this painting more so in the deeper meaning and that time travel between the image on the wall and what it represents and the figure in the foreground and, and, and how, you know, in these two different environments and spaces, right, this, this sort of uh, your artist friend, uh, a man of color, would have had different possibilities, right? Or, or, mm -hmm. um, and that's really, um, um, uh, really deeply impactful, right? Corey, I want to draw you in. I, we, we'll take some questions in a moment, but um, you know uh, what? I know this was this was a really I know uh, ex uh, a conversation you were excited to have as as a curator, right? Of you know of a collection of art, you know that kind of spans. Um, you know, a few decades of, of Europe um, and and uh, what audiences might think about it. Um, yeah, and I was thinking about when Mario was, was ar articulating the that aspect of dialogue between the figures, and I absolutely see your point, Mario, about how your figures are really confrontational in a very provocative, but also sometimes gentle way, and that that dialogue is is very intense. And so you know, one of the things that I've been wondering how you deal with, because I talk with a lot of students, and of course, you know, I'm dealing with the older works of art, and a lot of times students, whether they're art students or art history students or medical professionals, whatever, they come into a museum and they go immediately to the contemporary because that's new, that's exciting. They heard about a record, you know, an auction record, or, you know, it's very expensive <laughs> and flashy. And I'm always trying to say, but why did you go into the Baroque gallery? What about the Rococo gallery? And it can be hard mm -hmm. to convince people that there's value in that. And I know that as a, an artist and as a teacher, you must be making the case for students to think about that. And I can see how important it is for you because sometimes that dialogue, even if it's not quite as provocative in old master pictures, it can be... Um, you know, some, some in some ways a model for that. So I'm wondering how you, how do you convey the value of the old things to your students? Is it about the process or the subjects or the you know the timeless themes? How do you do that? Um, I, I think it's all of those things. I, you know, I think old paintings are really interesting. Some of them are really funny. Uh, you know, some of them are very funky. You know, if you if you look at like some 15th century paintings, you know. And you look at the babies and they look like grown men. It's like, who painted this? What is that? That You know, they, they have super large heads with little bodies. I, I, I just think, you know, it's so many contemporary artists. Um, and, and, and you're right, the artists that, that go for auction and everybody's really excited to see those. They are pulling so many different things from all of these older, older artists and these, these, um, these, these older paintings because they are, there's really, really crazy, funky stuff going on in them. And, and that's what I just try to get across to my students. You know, you can, um, when I was teaching at, at Princeton on campus, there's this one painting where this guy had on these tights and it had to be, it was probably like a, a 16th century, maybe a, a Italian painting. 
and he has on these tights and the tights are so like you could just see like he was just naked his butt was just like totally like glossy and the t- <laughs> it was like skin tights like what does he have on a bodysuit is he about to go dance i mean there's i mean there's so many different things to engage with um in these kind of paintings um and even thinking about somebody like uh if you look at a Terbork or if you look at a, a Bosch and and you look and you're looking from this very scenic point of view and you're looking at all these people and they're doing crazy stuff. Okay. It's just, I mean, I can, I can talk endlessly about why older paintings are very interesting. And I think the the primary thing about older artwork is that when you look at the way they are created and made, there's so many different aspects of art history within that one painting that is really compelling. You can find moments of minimalism. You can find moments of abstract uh, abstraction within the work, uh, the way they're laying down the paint on their surface. Um, and if you are an artist, the, one of the things that I do a lot is if I can, depending on the canvas, I try to look at the side of the painting, you know, see, see what the texture is doing. Um, and a lot of times you can, as a, as a painter, you can see the underpainting to see how the painting was built up in layers. Um, those things are incredibly interesting to me and are also teaching moments um, for students who are just learning how to paint, um, who are interested in certain stories. But yeah, there's there's something there for everyone. And I think the most engaging thing is that a lot of the stories that are being told in these 16th century paintings, 17th century paintings, we are essentially telling the same stories, but just in a different time. Um, you can even look at Madonna and Child and have contemporary artists who are de- dealing with that same subject matter, right? It, it, it might not be specifically about Christ and Madonna, um, but it could be about, um, you know, a, or something today where the subject matter is almost exactly the same. So I think going to that source and looking at that inspiration and seeing how they created the work is always going to be a way to kind of engage into a really interesting conversation and to find things that are, are, are just really wild, honestly. It's, it's, it's almost like, you know, a way of, and I want to get, I want to turn to questions, but just as a way to sort of, I think, maybe close this a little bit is it's, it sounds like you're also re um, it's also a way to draw out a history. That's maybe sometimes art history or other forms of history sort of foreclose and sort of limit, you know, like we're not going to, we're not going to touch that thing because it doesn't fit within this particular story and this particular story, right? When you go into collections, you see all these things, but maybe what's in the book, what's in the textbook mm-hmm. that you learn mm-hmm. is sort of a pared down version that, that you know, um, is sort of cleaned up in a way, you know? Um, and I think people like um, or want to experience messiness, if that makes sense. Messiness is maybe the wrong word, but that sort of variety, that's a better word, you know? Um, we have a great question from uh, Kijo, which I'd like to turn to, uh, and this is for you, Mario. Um, and then maybe, you know, uh, Corey, feel free to jump in afterwards as well. Uh, can Mario speak a bit about his way of rendering flesh tone and how that is informed or isn't by Artemisia Gentileschi? Is that something that you're um, you've thought thought about and thought through? Yeah, um, it's it's definitely influenced by Artemisia, and and like I said, um, you know the the DIA really has a, a great painting uh, by Artemisia, and I've seen others um, in person. Um, for me, when it comes to painting, and and what you really can't see from a digital image, is how do you make paint, the actual materiality of paint, work for you without trying to force it into being super smooth. Um, and I think Artemisia does that uh, in, in a really, really, really great way in that she deals with texture. So when you get up close, you can see the brush strokes. You can see some of the texture. You can see the luminosity of the paint. And that's what I try to do with, with my figures and in my um, the kind of skin that I'm dealing with. I'm also dealing with uh, people that weren't really painted that often. Um, and, and if they were painted during that time, they were often in the background. So a lot of the color choices that I'm making are very different, um, from an artist like Artemisia or, uh, Orazio or Caravaggio. Um, and, and I'm having to 
kind of multiply the kind of color choices that I'm using um, because it's actually a lot easier to paint white flesh than it is to to paint uh, someone who's black or uh, because you're dealing with blues, purples, greens, um, just a lot of different colors that you have to kind of consider um, instead of uh, one of my favorite painters who's Velasquez. He's a very limited palette and he can really, really achieve that uh, because of the kind of pinks um, and, and some of the blues that he would use for, for flesh. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and, and maybe to extend from it, it sounds like how have you, um, I think, it, uh, and Corey, feel free to jump in here too, but how is it, have you had to really so it sounds like you have a, a wider palette, right? Uh, when you're when you're you know uh, playing painting darker skin tones and and black people, but have you had to really rethink some of the sort of basics, right? Like, do you, is there is it like is your is your uh, base you know paint color very different? And have you had to really redo the tradition, if that makes sense? Um, yeah, it's a it's a learning curve. It's a learning curve because even in um, in art school, when you're learning uh, uh, some of the models, you might be lucky to get a, a black model. Um, so it, it is something that you have to you have to learn. Uh, but you also have some art historian greats who who dealt with different with different flesh tones. I think Peter Paul Rubens did some amazing uh, paintings of uh, kind of black studies of, uh, of black figures, and of course you have the really really famous uh, Velasquez painting. Um, and even that, he simplified the the palette uh, uh, for for the painting that hangs at the Met. Um, so, and and one thing I want to talk about is I, I add a little more color than all these other artists. My palette is usually sprawled with different colors. Um, I don't really simplify my palette too much. I kind of deal with the same colors, but I want to deal with those purples. I want to deal with those blues and greens, and 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 I want you to see that kind of depth uh, in in the figure's face. Um, hands and and wherever flesh is 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 kind of present. And I think that the you know the issues that Mario is talking about in terms of the he's talking about the identity of the subject, but also very practical kind of um, you know painterly issues and how you deal with materials. And for me, one of the interesting um, one of the interesting issues to think about in the context of maybe another more kind of traditional painter or um, someone whose name we might um, be familiar with, like Joshua Reynolds um, or, you know, Gainsborough, Lawrence, some of these 18th century, 19th century British painters who painted primarily white Europeans, but sometimes painted people of color, maybe from the East, um, maybe from, um, you know, from Africa. And to, to watch the artist struggle with a new kind of palette is really fascinating. And I think you can learn a lot about, you can learn a lot about colonialism, about expression of identity, as at the same time as you're learning about, you know, these very practical issues of how an artist who has you know, painted a certain type of person their whole life is suddenly dealing with painting a different type of flesh tone, because as, as Mario has pointed out, it can be hugely challenging. Um, you know, you think about Reynolds painting, um, you know, pale English ladies his whole life and then getting to tackle the subject of, you know, an African man. And to be able to look at that picture from the perspective of materials is, uh, you know, I'm thinking about an exhibition upcoming and something that I'm really excited to do as an art historian. That's exciting. That's really great um, to hear how, you know, this conversation is, um, is you know, kind of uh, not only, uh, it, it goes back into the understanding of the art of, of the 18th and the 17th and 16th century. That's really, really awesome. Um, I think we have time, what, time for one really quick question and maybe Mario, um, you know, you've mentioned the impact of sort of like, we're talking about Gentileschi today in relation to the Gentileschi show. Are there any other artists that, that, and you've, you've talked about Rivera and Velasquez. Are there any other artists artists that you draw from? Anyone that's sort of, or a particular, someone that you're thinking about right now? Um, so as far as contemporary goes, uh, uh, my favorite artist ever at this moment right now is Kerry James Marshall. Um, because I think he's uh, engaged in 
something uh, very similar that I'm interested in, which is art history and, and how to have a conversation with art history, but also be very engaged with what you're doing today um, and what's going on around you today. And, and I think what he uses um, that's really engaging is the different levels of art history that you can engage with. And I think that's something, uh, Corey, that you know you asked earlier is, is about like, what do you talk to your students about? Or how do you en- get them engaged with these older paintings? And Carrie James Marshall does that extremely well, right? Because there's something there for everyone through art history. And in particular, if we talk about this painting here, uh, me and my friend, Mark Gibson, um, who's the, the figure in the painting, uh, is an amazing artist. And we were both inspired by the painting at the Met by Peter Paul Rubens. And in that painting, it, you know, it's a, it's a painting of, I think it's the hunt of the fox and the wolf, or I think it's something like that. And there's these figures and they're fighting and battling. And we were talking about these battle paintings. And, and as I talked to him about the idea for this piece, I was, I was like, Mark, it would be interesting if I could do a painting of you in your studio you know, making some, making a work. But what I didn't want to do was make a painting of him and his painting behind him. Instead, I was like, you know, we both love Peter Paul Rubens. We love these battle paintings. What if you did a drawing of a battle painting in your style? It's, it's very different from mine. I take that drawing and I turn it into a piece or a kind of style that has the kind of same feel of a, of a kind of Peter Paul Rubens chaotic battle. So I used his drawing as a source and then I turned that drawing into this painting. So it's this, this kind of crazy collaboration between time and artists. So it's me, Mark Gibson and Peter Paul Rubens, you know, like kind of coming together mm-hmm. to kind of engage with time in a different way. And um, and I think that's what uh, Carrie James Marshall is, is really, really good at is talking about art history, but using the kind of moment and spaces for today, even when he's dealing with abstraction, you know, something that he talks about often. And and, uh, you know, there's a there's a way in which he uh, kind of also pokes fun of it a, a little bit. Uh, me, on the other hand, I, I kind of I grew up. Um, with a lot of abstract artists, a lot of artists that were dealing with uh, uh, different things. So I have an appreciation for kind of all aspects of, of art um, throughout art history. Uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the artist right there. K- K- KJM, that's the one. <laughs> He's a yeah, pretty, pretty amazing, um, uh, you know, um, artist. I mean, I think we had a show of his of his work at the Prince and Drawings Gallery, if I'm correct, Corey, I think a few years ago during Front, I could be wrong. So that's um, wonderful that we have a connection with him too. So I think we're at time. So uh, we could keep going, which is not a bad thing. Um, but I want to thank uh, both you, Mario, and you, Corey, for joining us this afternoon. It's been a really enlightening and wonderful conversation. Uh, it's been great to have you. Uh, and I want to thank everyone out there for joining us too. Uh, I also want to highlight a couple of upcoming events um, on uh, Wednesday, June 2nd at noon. You can join us for our next desktop dialogue, the Generations of Queer Art, for which we invited uh, teens from the Queer Youth Initiative at the LGBT Community Center in Greater Cleveland to discuss how the representation of queer artists in the CMA collection resonates uh, with young people in the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, so join us for that in two weeks. And also, um, that same evening, June 2nd at 7 p.m., uh, CMA is going to be hosting our first virtual distinguished lecture. Uh, so join us for the Pauline and Joseph Degenfelder Distinguished Lecture in Chinese Art, uh, which is titled Chinese Textiles from the Silk Road. Uh, the lecturer will be uh, Zhao Feng, who's the director of the China National Silk Muse- Museum uh, in Hangzhou. So it'll be really wonderful to, um, you know, to do something we can't do right now, right, which is, you know, have a speaker from from uh, ac- across the across the globe, uh, join us here in Cleveland and hopefully have visitors across the globe. So we're really excited about that. Um, you can find out more about these and other upcoming programs and register for them at cma.org. Uh, if you would like to explore more of the works in our collection, visit CMA Collection online. 
uh, if we didn't get to your question during the program, or if you have more, you can always go to Artlands Ask on the CMA website and someone will get back to you with an answer. Uh, links for both and all the things I've just mentioned, as well as Mario's website and the Jen Teleski exhibition at CMA are below us. So um, take care everyone and have a good afternoon. Stay well.